It wasn't too long after our adventure with Cedric that Chip came home with an even bigger surprise. He'd found a couple who wanted to buy our Castle Heights house, so he'd gone out and bought us a new house to move into and flip. What? I said. Chip, I love this house. You were just saying that this house isn't good for the kids, Joe. I know, but we can change that. I mean, Chip, this isn't just another house. This is a forever house. Joe, this was never meant to be our forever house. We're not ready for our forever house. This isn't everything for us. It isn't everything we want. This is a flip house. It's a big flip house. It's a nice flip house, but it's still a flip house. We knew that going into it. When Chip drove me over to see the new house, I didn't say a word in the car. I was mentally and emotionally preparing myself so I wouldn't lose it. It was a long, gray, one-story shotgun of a house that had been built in the 1980s. It had no character. It had no charm. It had no style. It was in a great little pocket neighborhood called Carriage Square, but it sat on a smaller lot than the rest of the houses there, and it backed right up to another family's chain-link fence without so much as a sliver of a backyard. It had a tiny little sloping front yard, too, that ran right into the street. Nothing stately, nothing old, nothing beautiful. I hated it. Of course, you've got to remember that Joe pretty much hated every new flip house that we ever moved into the first she laid eyes on it. I think this one just stung a lot more because we were coming off of such a gorgeous old house. Maybe we had stayed there a little too long. It had been years by the time this all unfolded. We were getting pretty comfortable in that house. I've got to say, I don't like it when things get too comfortable. To me, it's a motivation thing. Comfort is what you do when you retire. So if there's any way you can keep pushing off that I'm completely comfortable idea, then it keeps you a little bit wily. It keeps you young. It keeps you hungry. It's kind of Rocky-esque. In those movies, Rocky Balboa had all the hunger and desire when he first started out. It wasn't until after he had all the money and the cars and the house and the wife and the kid and the dog that something kind of happened. He lost that fire. For me, I've always thought of moving as part of that motivation. Houses for me are just investments. Inventory, if you will. That's it. So if you've got the money to live in the house that you're in, well then great. But whenever things were tight then it immediately comes back to, hey, this is just an investment. It's like a car dealer who drives a BMW for a couple of weeks, knowing that if all hell breaks loose, he'll sell the car. Because again, it's just inventory. Once we settled into the Castle Heights house, I think we both started to settle into a groove. The business was rocking and rolling, and so we just started to think, you know, we've made it. We're here. Let's put everything on autopilot. But here's something I've noticed. Whenever you do that, Whenever you're all settled in and think that's it, that's when the big blow comes and knocks you back to square one. That hadn't happened. Yet. In fact, Waco was pretty steady. We didn't experience the tsunami of economic slowdown that the rest of the country experienced after the housing market collapsed in 2008. As we rolled into 2010, and even 11, the effects of that were just starting to make their way into the Waco economy. Even that didn't affect us personally, not right off the bat, but I could already see that it was taking a little longer to move a flip property. Rental income had dropped just a little bit too. It was just these little incremental things, and I wanted to make sure we hedged against that, and the best way I knew how to do that was to sell our current house, take that equity, and downsize a little bit. Then we could coast a while if our new home sales or our flip properties took a little longer to sell. There was another motivating factor to move quickly, too. On top of the fact, I just thought it was time to break out of this comfort cycle and maybe kick our lives into a second gear again. In early 2011, we started up a new big development project. We've decided to go ahead and develop a track of land not far from our shotgun house. It was land that we'd invested in with some of the money that we'd made back when Dad and I sold most of those 11 acres over on 3rd Street. The reason my dad and I never developed the 11 acres ourselves was that we lacked the basic knowledge needed to get it done. Back then, we'd been guessing at everything, figuring out where to put streets and curbs and how to get permits. At one point, we thought we could put up to 40 houses on that land. And that was important because there's tremendous economy of scale when you get a project that big going. You can buy all of your lumber and concrete and everything in bulk, which lifts your profit margins in a big way but we couldn't make the 40 houses work. We found out that the bank was only going to lend us enough money to build eight units. Eight. And that just wasn't enough. So we kept messing around with it, and the most we could get financing for was 12 units. That still didn't make economic sense. 
So we sold the land on 3rd Street, keeping a little bit by the road frontage to put those 12 houses on. And the big developers we sold the land to, who actually knew what they were doing and had the financing to back it, came in and put more than 50 units of student housing on the back parcel of that property alone. We'd struggled to figure out how to get 40 units on the entire track, including the front piece that we'd ended up keeping. They were just better at it than we were, and I learned a ton just by watching that project come together. I knew they were going to make millions of dollars on that deal, so as excited as I was about making a couple hundred thousand dollars, I promised myself that one day I'd be doing deals like theirs. Now, all those years later, I was smarter than I was back then. I had a lot more pull with the banks. I had a bigger crew. I knew people who could draw up plans and help us get the permits through the city. So we got the whole process started, and I knew that it was going to take a lot of money up front to get this thing done. That just served as yet another incentive for us to move into the Carriage Square house. Living in that smaller place would cut our mortgage payment in half. I didn't even like the looks of that house as an investment property, let alone a place to continue raising our family. Yet because of the way Chip does business, I quickly came to the conclusion that, once again, there was no fighting this decision. It was already a done deal. A great couple already had their hearts set on our Castle Heights home, and Chip had already sunk the down payment into that shotgun house at Carriage Square. By this point, I had learned to adjust my thinking quickly since I never knew what Chip would come up with next. I wanted to stay comfortable, but I finally started to realize that with change comes new opportunity. Even though I was sad to leave our home, I quickly got on board with Chip and thought of all the new memories our family could make in this new place. There was a part of me that was challenged to create beauty in a house that seemed to have no potential. Once again, we didn't want to do the renovations while we were living in a house with four little kids, so we set about doing the renovations just as quickly as we possibly could before we had to leave that Tudor dream house behind in the rearview mirror. The guilt I felt over not creating any space in the Castle Heights house where my kids could be themselves was still hanging over me when all of this unfolded, and I made myself a promise that I would make a special place for them in this new house. I think that was my first ever truly intentional design goal. I wanted to make this next house be much more enjoyable and accessible and comfortable for our family. And the more I thought about it, the more I wanted to be intentional about giving each one of us our own things to love about this new house, even if I didn't love the house itself. So how will I go about doing that, I wondered. I was getting more and more confident about my eye for detail, my ability to find great furniture and objects at flea markets and yard sales, and to let the character of those old finds shine through in a way that made any room more interesting. But I'd been applying most of that vision to other people's houses through our renovation and flip projects. I'd even applied it to how people would view our own home. What might look good in a magazine shoot? What might people want to buy when they came to a Magnolia home show? And what might inspire them to hire us to come tackle a renovation project in their home? As we prepared to make that transition to a smaller house with a much smaller yard and only one story of living space, I decided to focus in on us. How could I remodel this house to make it work for us? I would still adhere to the things I'd learned about classic color schemes and using lots of wood and putting three-dimensional objects on the walls, even using pieces that were traditionally for the outdoors. All of those things that appealed to other people were also what appealed to me, so I wasn't ruling anything out or purposely thinking about making it unattractive to anyone else. I just wanted to put us first, all of us. I started thinking a whole lot about another mentor of Chip's, Uncle Ricky, the attorney uncle of his college friend, the one who had helped him set up the fireworks stand business over a couple of summers. What Uncle Ricky did was create this wonderful home environment for his family. He built a beautiful house that was brand new but looked like it was 100 years old, and his stunning backyard made you feel as if you were stepping into a vacation somewhere far from Texas the moment you walked out onto their screened-in back porch. He built up that backyard over many years, adding a cute little setting here and then another cute setting over there, incorporating all sorts of antiques they purchased over the years. I always loved to go there because there was always some new, interesting treasure to see in that backyard. I don't know if Ricky or his wife have any idea how inspiring that was to me. It wasn't on public display or anything. Nobody but their close friends and family knew any of that stuff was there. It was just for them. But whatever they did, they did it well. And if they couldn't do it all at once, they just built it up over time. They even named the place T-Berry Farm. Ricky had a hat made up with T-Berry Farm right on it, and he wore that hat pretty much every single day. 